quick moment to jog your memory here. We left off with Andrea's code being snatched by a web creature. Matrix almost killing everyone trying to chase it down, the revelation that Tracer is not quite as he seems, and the presence of a strange race of... something riding out there in the web. It seems unavoidable that conflict is coming, and Tracer has no idea what these things are or what they want. And all the while, Andrea is getting worse and worse. Then think of something! We can't just let Andrea be deleted! No fight here! No stress, Princess. Everything's online. Look, I understand your frustration. I really do. But your fight ain't with me. It's with whoever drove that beastie away. Listen, I'm not doing any good around here. I'm gonna see if I can't get a fix on the web creature that bit her. This is all my fault. If I hadn't been so jealous, I would have been there to protect you. Now I could lose you forever. Web Riders on the Storm was written by Len Wein, with story by Gavin Blair, Ian Pearson, Dan DiDio, Len Wein, Phil Mitchell, and Marv Wolfman. The main cast includes Paul Dobson as Matrix, Sharon Alexander as Andrea, Lon John Baldry as Gavin Capacitor, Donald Gibson as Ray Tracer, Michael Donovan as Mr. Christopher, Kathleen Barr as Princess Bula and Miss Sally, Scott McNeil as Mr. Andrew, and Ian James Corlett as Mr. Norton, and someone very special. Tensions ride high as everyone is greatly concerned for Andrea. It's obvious her time is short. In the next scene we get a distance shot of the saucy mare, following the surfer through the strange seas of the web, as they track these creatures and riders. Mr. Christopher approaches the captain, concerned that the trip isn't making a profit, and the captain says there are some things more important than money. In one of the funniest double takes I've ever seen, all the pirates turn to him and stare, dead silent. He then dives into a speech about honour and paying back debt to a friend, while lawyer-friendly music plays. Mr. Christopher agrees in the end, but asks, hilariously, How do I enter that in the ledger? This is a nice exchange, not just because it's funny, but because we get a look at Capacitor's psyche and what he's feeling. In the next scene, Matrix has strapped himself to a huge machine in the belly of the ship. This is basically a blood transfusion apparatus that will allow him to transfer energy from himself to Andrea to prolong her life. It will leave him very weak, though. Meanwhile, the surfer's hunt bears fruit. Stand ready, mates! Turn three degrees to port and come to a stop, Mr. Andrew. We'll wait for the surfer here. Aye, aye, Captain. Arr, sir. The surfer is exiting the storm. What? Already? Yes, Captain. And he's not alone. Whoever these riders are, they're coming in full force. They manage to open the side hatch and Tracer slips in before the marauders are totally on top of them. But now the marauders are totally on top of them. Capacitor orders his gunners to man their stations, and they open fire as the riders close in range. I guess diplomacy's off the table? I know these riders sort of attacked them before, but I'm just surprised Capacitor never tries talking to them. I guess it's not really his style. The ship is rocked by the returning fire of the rider's weapons. We see again into the bunks where Andrea and Matrix are, as Matrix has grown rather pale from the continual drain. He's a tough cookie, though, and doesn't complain even though it seems very painful. We're treated to cool action scenes in the meantime. The pacing continues to ramp up as the action continues. 
From here until almost the very end, the episode moves into high-octane mode, with a few quiet moments here and there for effect. The gunners on the ship are the most accurate in the world, as they take their sweet time to snag a few targets. To be fair, they are moving very fast, and they're also inflicting damage to the ship, including one of them knocking one of the turns out of commission. As things take a turn for the worst, Capacitor orders Christopher to summon Matrix so he can help. Matrix is reluctant to leave Andrea, but Christopher takes his place, so he wobbles up to the deck. And yeah, Matrix is out of it. He sways back and forth. You know when you're sick with the flu or something like that, and you're just very weak? That's what he looks like. Nonetheless, he gets to work helping the crew, and showing why he's a good guy to have in a fight. He uses the support beams of the ship to make his way up against the armor of the ship. He forces the business end of his gun through the membrane of the organic plates and goes to work. give a celebratory shout as Matrix's efforts seem to scare them away. Capacitor thanks him, and Matrix has time to ponder whether Bob might have encountered these strangers. Epic foreshadowing alert! Epic foreshadowing alert! Epic foreshadowing alert! Sorry, my foreshadowing alarm went off there. Don't know why. Anyways, they don't get much reprieve, because the writers return, and this time, they've brought friends. The web creature heard. The captain and Mr. Andrew try their best to steer the ship out of the way of the incoming creatures... But... Brace yourselves for impact! Unfortunately, the ship doesn't weather the attack as well as they might have hoped, since the armor plating tears at one spot. It's not clear whether this is the same spot where Matrix poked his gun out, but it might be. The sudden change in pressure does some nasty things to those inside. Objects, and even one crew member, are sucked out into the void of the web. Everyone else manages to buckle down, and eventually everything equalizes. But unfortunately, the riders begin to enter the ship through the opening. Capacitor gives the order to repel the borders. The battle is joined. Princess Bula, Tracer, Matrix, Capacitor, and everyone else who can reasonably fight attacks with all of their might. And they definitely hold their own, but the entities start gaining the upper hand, eventually tossing them around. Degraded sprites! Well, there's the detrimental effects of web exposure that have been hinted at before. They're not so different after all. Also, I haven't mentioned this before, but the writer's language are modem dial up sounds. I love that. I absolutely love that. There's something the kids today won't get. Good luck explaining dial up internet to anyone under the age of 16. Anyways, the fight proceeds as you might expect. That is, poorly. One by one our heroes are overwhelmed, and the riders actually start lining them up to be shot. It would take an absolute miracle to save them now. But here, in this tense, silent, atmospheric moment, someone does arrive. He tells the other riders to stand down, and he saves the damn day, just like he was doing for two full seasons.
No one says anything for the moment. The look on Enzo's face confirms that he's at least figured it out. I hope you have. Before anything else can be done or said, a very weak and pale Christopher comes up from the bunks, informing those around him that he's all out of energy to spare, that Andrea is fading. Without a word, this blue stranger, now wielding Glitch, heads downstairs. Compassor's baffled that Matrix will let him, obviously not having clued in, but Matrix just says he's here to help. He heads down, straps himself into the apparatus, which seems to stabilize her, and finally reveals a PID badge under his organic armor. It's the same color as Enzo's. He downloads something to Andrea's badge, and she finally awakens. Her first words? Bob, we found you. In response, the man removes his helmet. You just can't talk in these things. Bob! Whoa! I think you're a little too big for that. It's Bob! They did it! They found him! Oh, I'm so happy. Mission accomplished. Their struggles have borne incredible fruit. They still have to return to mainframe, and they still have some viruses to deal with. But this is a big step in the right direction. The moment where he swoops in during the fight to bring the struggle to an end is spine-tingling. And the slow reveal of who this stranger is is wonderfully done. If the previous episode was holding its breath, then this tale let it all out in one action-packed exhale. It builds on the long-awaited promise of bringing back and rescuing Bob. And does it in a way that Bob honestly ends up being the one doing the rescuing. All the silly and petty jealousy stuff is gone, and it corrects its mistakes in the previous tale because it has an immediate story, the battle with the writers, and resolves that in a way that also brings a very triumphant and satisfying arc to a close. If there was any doubt we're a few episodes away from the end now, this should dissolve such doubts. A dramatic and feel-good tale, I give this episode 3 after 3 fedoras.